Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Big Bros Podcast. Welcome if it's your first time joining us. My name is Jeremy and I'm joined by my lovely friend and co-host Ilan. How are you going, mate? Yeah, mate, I'm pretty good. Just a bit exhausted on a Sunday. Um, we went out last night, didn't we? We did. It's uh, It's been the festival of birthdays recently. I mean, wasn't too long ago it was yours in in. I mean, January, but then it was mm. mine in February. And then we had a couple in March and we we enjoyed the birthdays of some of our other friends last night as well, didn't we? So mm. it, was a, it was a big night in the end, wasn't it? It wasn't. Yeah. I mean, it started off with, you know, your casual pre's at our mate's house and moved on to Shanghai Dumplings where it's the first place where we've made a booking and been given our table 30 minutes after after our booking. So that was an interesting experience. But uh yeah, then we went to play some bowling, which was good. Didn't we? Yeah, I mean, it was a bit, bit rogue Saturday night. I mean, people are probably thinking, why the hell aren't you in a club or something? But, you know, when you, you've got a few drinks in your system and you're looking for something different to do as well, bowling was elite. We split off into different teams and oh, we, yeah, we had the fun. beer towers going as well. You know, and uh, it was, it was, there was, you know, a fair amount of competition amongst us too. Yeah, it was, it was good. good. I mean, my idea of fun isn't just doesn't revolve being in a club with doof doof music you know i think there's a bit more fun things you can do on a saturday night yeah so. and i think that's what should be a bit more normalized as blokes as well you know if you're in your 20s you don't have to just go out and get pissed in bars and clubs and that's your idea of fun and if that's your idea of fun fair play to you but um yeah i think it's 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 nice to see you i, I guess within our friendship group that the reins have been taken into different domains now and like we're looking at doing different things like you know for Brendan's birthday a few weeks ago we went on a weekend away and we were by the beach and um, we we planned activities for that which was epic and then last night we had other activities as well which was just great levels and great differences and varieties of fun. Mm, and I think as we get older the things we do will be a little bit more tame. I, I give it another year and a half or two years. We'll be going to wineries down the peninsula. <laughs> I think that's what's on store. I don't think there'll be any more clubs or, you know, young people activities. We'll I think see, we're mate. aging quite quickly. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that, mate. Young at heart, you know. Young at, young heart, at, young young, at heart. Young always, mate. Awesome. Forever young. Anyways, mate, let's dive into this week's episode. As you guys can see, we're discussing the non-negotiables in finding a partner. What are our absolute non-negotiables, the things that our girlfriends or future girlfriends must have in order for us to want to be with them? And this is important because this is where you set your boundaries in your relationship. This is where you identify what is truly important to you in a, in a partner. And, you know, these are things that I've learned so far just based off dating girls whether it be seriously or casually and i i think it's important that everyone thinks of these non-negotiables and you know we often hear about taking everyone as they come and you know opening yourself up to a whole variety of different people when it comes to dating and when it comes to potentially finding someone but i think there are core values that should always remain the same in terms of what you are looking for and it's important to recognize those for sure and just a cautionary bit of advice for anyone listening. These are our own sort of prerequisites. It's not necessarily that these need to be mapped onto everyone else. Everyone has their own preferences, so they're unique. But hopefully our discussion might encourage you to think about what is important to you and what are the things you're looking for. Because the red flags you ignore at the start are the same reasons you end that relationship you know, later down the line. And usually when we're younger and we get that first girlfriend and we get that first situationship, we're just happy to be there. Maybe as young guys we are at least. And then it ends and you get burned for a specific reason. And then you do a little bit of reflection and you look at some of the kind of red flags or the warning signs you could have avoided. And then you're like, all right, well, maybe in my next relationship, I should probably you know, look out for these. You have another relationship that might and, and then you get a bit more of a comprehensive idea of the things that you do like in a person, the things you don't like in a person. And mm -hmm. from there, you can start formulating for my, you know, my soon to be life partner, 
what are the qualities that they need to have and that's usually informed by you know past breakups past experiences seeing you know your mates in certain um situations where they were burnt or where they had to end a relationship so also also looking at your parents as well i think is a, a prime example too i mean we don't necessarily need to look outside and look at the friends that we've got and their partners or what we're seeing on television we can just look i guess you know maybe it's your parents or family members or relatives and looking at their relationships and taking from it what looks incredible mm. to you and maybe something that you might not actually like the look of and, and don't want to have in in your relationship mm. or future relationship for sure so jeremy let's get it underway what's your number one or rather what's your first non-negotiable I think the first thing, yeah, not necessarily, I don't think we're going to put these into order, mm. but I think one of the first that comes to mind is someone that is extremely driven in something. I want to be with someone that has incredible aspirations for themselves and is driven to working towards that and to bettering themselves towards that. And that could be anything. It could be their career. It could be their personal growth, their level of fitness. It could even be working on themselves mentally if they in, were potentially in a state of maybe they weren't so happy with themselves mentally. So whether it's working on themselves mentally, physically, from a career perspective, academic perspective, there needs to be a big element of personal growth and ambition and drive in that person. There's nothing worse than being with someone that is quite passive, that is quite lazy and is just happy to just go with the flow. That's if you're someone that is pretty driven yourself. If you're someone that is like laid back, you don't really know what you're doing in life and you're just kind of figuring it out on the way to an extent because I mean, there's elements of that for all of us where we're just figuring stuff out on the way. But I think it's important to have some level of drive and desire whether it be just you know the the, the physical the, the physical aspect to yourself like getting out of bed in the morning and wanting to go for a walk going for a run going to the gym going to your pilates class yoga class whatever it is just something that gets you up and about in the morning something that gives you some drive and purpose to go out there and do something with your day so that i think that's just one of the most attractive qualities let alone something that is non-negotiable yeah i'm inclined to agree i don't think there's much debate here i think whether your ambitions lie in becoming a boss bitch at a corporate company or getting yourself into a position where you're happy with your personal growth or even becoming the best mum or the best father yeah these are all great goals. Everyone's got different, unique objectives that they want to achieve in life. Mm. So it's not for us to criticize what that person wants to achieve. It's unique to them. Talk to me about impulse control. What does that mean as a non-negotiable for you and a partner? It means having a partner who isn't at the whim of all their emotions and instincts. What that means is they can think about decisions even during times where they're, they're quite emotionally distressed and they can still made, make a decision that doesn't harm anyone so there's going to be times in life where you're under a lot of stress and you might be quite tempted to make an impulsive decision and you forget about the fact that there's a long-term consequence to that decision the thing is having a lack of impulse control is what tends to happen as an example when you drink a lot of you know you drink a lot your inhibitions lower and you can make a lot of stupid decisions Someone who can control their impulses is one that might be able to control their financial spending, how much they eat. So it has implications on their health, right? It also has implications on how they speak to you. If you're in an argument with them, maybe they have this impulsive desire to say something really hurtful and offensive because they're angry in the moment. But someone who has really, really good impulse control can almost take a step back and just realize okay that's probably not the wise thing to say how do you know that in someone when you're dating them say you've been on a date maybe three four five times with someone you know you're progressing quite well you're both there for the intention of pursuing something seriously how do you pick up on little hints about their impulse control if this is a non-negotiable for you well i think you look at times 
and experiences where they've referenced, you know, uh, an emotional point in their life? Are they referencing any sort of specific coping mechanisms that might be driven by impulse? So as a really bad example, you could say, yeah, look, I was really stressed, you know, during this period of my life. And you, you know, not to make your dates a psychology session, but, you know, if you get into conversations like, wow, like what helped you get through those times? Like, you know, it's stressful. I just spent a lot of money on online shopping. You know what I mean? Or if they start telling you about the fact that they've been in multiple relationships before and then you say, yeah, they always end up in arguments and so forth. These little things, it's not that they're indicative that the person has low impulse control, but what it might suggest is that that person is very much dictated by their thoughts and they might not be conscious of the long-term effects of the decisions that they make. Mm. And it's not for you to decide after three, four dates whether they have low impulse control. It's something that takes time. Truthfully, it doesn't, you won't really pick it up until maybe a few months after you truly get to know them. And even after a few months, you don't know your partner, give it a few years, but you, you get a sense of who they are as a person. When they get angry at you, do they become toxic? Do they want to just shut you off? Do they want to make you jealous? Do they want to say hurtful things that aren't conducive just because they're angry? Those are the things you look out for. Mm. Jeremy, tell me about hobbies. Massive. Sounds simple, but massive. Okay. Someone needs to be... It, it honestly links back to the previous point as well about you know working towards being ambitious about something. To an, to an extent, it's quite similar, but someone that has the same, not necessarily the same hobbies, but same interests as you is important, but hobbies as well. Something that gets them, gets them going, gets them excited. You know, we're all going to be working, but work isn't our default. Work shouldn't be, you know, the, the theme of what we talk about, what we do together. It shouldn't be the, the 70% of what our relationship is is revolving around it should be hobbies it should be the time spent together you know they should be someone that is in is enjoys getting up to as much as what what you do and like i'm someone that loves to do a lot i love my sport i love socializing with my friends i love being in nature um, music just to reel off a few i would want to be with someone that is you know as passionate not necessarily about those things but can reel off a few things for themselves as well. And I really like, I like really, really means it when they, when they can reel those things off because it's easy to be on a date and be with someone and they can say that they are into things, but then you're with them maybe a month, two months, three months down the line. Maybe you're dating a little bit more seriously and you can kind of just pick up on what, what they were saying, whether it's rubbish or not, or whether it's actually truthful and you you pick up on those things whether it's like a theme of their daily living or not because i like to make my hobbies essentially a theme of my weeks maybe not days but my weeks it's something that keeps me feeling myself when when life gets in the way when shit gets tough when work gets hectic you fall back on your hobbies the things that make you feel alive again you know and someone needs to and I really, yeah, would want to be with someone that has those hobbies for themselves and even better if it's shared hobbies with me, even if it, if, if it's shared hobbies, if it's shared passions, shared interests far out, like that is so underrated. They, they normally say that, you know, you, you don't have to be, you don't have to be on the same wavelength as your partner in order to, to get along. It's like the yin and yang, like opposites attract. I think that's a little bit of bullshit. I think if you've got a lot of commonality with someone when dating them, it's only going to make you guys have so much more fun together in your relationship. If you're very sporty, if you're very into your fitness and so are they far out, that's going to be so much fun together. You're going to become, you're going to become mates as, as, as well as lovers because you're going to make that such a theme of your time together and how good is that? That's what you want. You, if you're into your nature, if you're into your outdoor activities, how good would it be to be with someone that you can go camping with, you can go hiking with, that loves those things to the same extent that you, that you do? So important to have those shared interests and hobbies. Definitely a non-negotiable for me. Yeah, I, I have nothing else more to add to that. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I want to talk to you about someone who gets offended at everything. 
that is a massive red flag for me. I want to be, when I, when, you know, I started going out with Rachel, something that I really thought about was like, I don't want to be walking on eggshells. And the fact of the matter is I love making some rogue jokes. I love, I have a bit of a dark sense of humor. And I think sense of humor and play, even what you were talking about, they're such massive predictors of your relationship happiness. You want to be with someone where you can say things and you know that person's not going to just be instantaneously offended. They're not going to think that what you're saying is always a critique of them. And I think that is such an important and necessary, for me at least, quality because the alternative is quite shit. You know, imagine you imagine you think you're having a little bit of banter. You think you're having a nice little chat, and all of a sudden the mood just drops. Yeah, you make Their a joke face that drops. They don't like whether it's about you know whether politics is getting involved in the conversation or not, and they just don't like it. And just a side note, sorry to interrupt you. You should be dating someone more or less with the same political views as you. Yeah, that, and that, that that's might, a non-negotiable. And because that, that's because I think. Yeah, because your political views are a reflection of your values, and the last thing you want to do is you know be five six years into a relationship, and you're talking about potentially having kids now with this person, and that you they have a disagreement with how they you want to raise the kids. Maybe you want to raise them in a more conservative fashion. They want to raise them in a more progressive way, and then that has implications and arguments. So that's kind of another point but back to the point about uh you were saying about well i know i actually want to go back into that point about the politics beliefs because i think that relates to what you were saying about not being on eggshells as well i think that's a whole that's a whole point within itself and so important and important because it was one that i actually never used to think was important before before my past relationship I thought that politics actually wasn't all that important when dating. I thought, yeah, why not date someone if they've got different political beliefs to you? Um, And yeah, I think just through dating and through experiencing dating firsthand myself, I couldn't disagree with my previous beliefs more. I think, like you said, it is so important to have those same shared political beliefs because like you said it interrelates to your values it 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 essentially acts as a guide to life it's a guide to how you're going to raise your kids a guide to how you're going to speak and communicate to one another a guide to your actions your behaviors together the way you view work the way you view routine and activity and your finances your finances everything everything it is so important and i don't think we should be scared to talk about our values and political beliefs from the get-go and this is something we've discussed previously on episodes as well is don't be scared to talk about them because if you guys don't connect in terms of politics and values great like you've 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 realized that you don't connect and you know that you're not suited for each other then like imagine how shit it would be if all you want to do is watch andrew bolt on sky news and all your partner wants to do is just watch abc like, you know, completely polar opposite spectrums of yeah. our news services that we've got in Australia. But, you know, even as simple as that, it makes a difference. Yeah. But back to the point about being easily offended, that goes for like not dating what people would now deem the snowflake generation. You know, being with someone who is resilient is also a very attractive thing. It's a non-negotiable as well. I think resilience is so important. Again, my, if, if there's anything you've learned about me from doing this podcast and I preach about it so much is this whole journey of life is going to be throwing so many curveballs at you. How can you develop yourself into the most strongest, capable individual that you can be? Resilience is all is a, is a vital aspect that encompasses that well-rounded individual who can deal with any curveballs that life throws at them. Mm. And I think resilience and not being easily offended, they can actually go hand in hand. The people who can, you know, almost have the attitude of water off the duck's back. Yeah. They tend to go a long way. And I think you can pick up on resilience pretty early in, in your dating as well. Like I like to think of why, why I keep asking you questions about, you know, like how can you pick up on these? Like when you're dating is because I think it's important if we're talking about non-negotiables, I like to think about my non-negotiables essentially from the get go when like I'm 
I'm thinking about dating someone more seriously, you know, and, and thinking about where I'm seeing this on our dates. And I think resilience can be picked up on pretty quickly in terms of dating because it can be minor things like you've taken the wrong the wrong turn to go to the destination mm. that we're going to together. You know, it can be in that moment where one of you freaks out, like say the, the part you've taken the wrong turn, you're in the driver's seat, your partner starts freaking out a bit versus someone that's like, it's all right, there's another turn, we'll get there. That's an example of being calm and being resilient that it's all going to be okay. Small example, but I think you can pick up on those things quite early in dating or when they're talking about their past traumas that they might have gone through, their past, you know, challenges that they've faced, whether they were, you know, incredibly debilitated by them to the point where they struggled to continue on with life and and being themselves or whether, you know, they recognize, yeah, that was a freaking hard time period of my life. It was shit. I allowed myself to feel that shitness for a certain period of time, but I, I, I put in the steps to, to get better and I don't allow that to, you know, get me down again. I learned a lesson from that. You know, you, you, you pick up on resilience. You pick up on accountability pretty quickly, I think. Talk to me about materialism, the, as, the aspect, the thought of being so induced in materialistic items, materialistic products, is that a non-negotiable for you in finding a partner? Do you do you care about that stuff if they're into all of that or do you not? Yeah, look, I don't really care if a person's a superficial individual or most of their interests rely around materialistic items. I just don't want to be in a relationship with that person because I'm not into those things largely. I have way more, you know, I'd say I have way more nuanced interests. Like I love talking politics. I love you know, speaking about deeper level stuff, personal growth. And I'm not saying a person can't have materialistic interests. Like for example, if they're really interested in like celebrity gossip or, you know, the latest makeup brands, I don't actually care if you're into that, but if that's your entire personality, even worse, the people have like a dog, but the dog is their entire personality. Mm, yeah. You, you, we know like there's people on Instagram who you just look at them and you know, that's their entire personality. And you think like, you know, what else is there? And I love, I love dogs. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, you should love your dog. You should show off your dog, but surely there's a little bit more about your personality than just, you know, things that you can show off or promote. And dogs aren't necessarily materialistic, but you get my drift. It's more so, yeah, it's more so about superficial. Mm. Like we mentioned materialis- materialism, but superficial. You think I want to be hearing about Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift? I'd rather be talking about the declining birth rate in Japan with my partner. <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough. So that's a non-negotiable <laughs> for me. Jeremy, a few weeks ago, we posted a TikTok and you said that if a girl has no friendship group, that is a red flag. <laughs> yeah, what's funny? <laughs> well, it's just, I remember the hook of the video and it was literally that if a girl has no friends or no friendship group, that's a red flag. What did you actually mean by that? Oh, well, you know, it's what I said in that video and what I said in that podcast. I think, yeah, I got a lot of, I got a bit of hate um, for for that. And um, yeah, I basically said that for me, you know, it, a non-negotiable is someone that has friends. Doesn't necessarily need to be a friendship group. Um, they don't necessarily need to have a friendship group. I even said like two friends is different to one friend, but I think they need to have some friends. Why? Because friends are non-negotiable for me in my life. I love my friends. I love being around my friends. And I would want to share that with my partner. It's your non-negotiable. It's not mine. But I, I think of this whole friendship thing and that TikTok you posted and everything. And like my personal view on it is there are people out there who don't want to have, you know, they're happy with one or two really good friends. And I yeah. know you said that's not really a big, bit of an issue, but like, you know, they're not always going to be able to, you, let's say you end up dating someone who only has one or two good friends, but they're really quality people. Mm. And they're not able to like always mix in those friends because the quantity of friends is, you know, relative to you far less. So yeah, they that's can't, fine. You can't, would you still say that's a, you know, that's a non, like, that's a bad thing? It's- I think the aspect of numbers needs to be taken out. Well, you it. put it into numbers, truthfully. Well, I said I said one friend is different to two friends. 
there's always going to be some element of numbers here if we're talking about the quantity but we need to understand we need to recognize that it's about the quality more so if you've got two good quality friends as as a girl that's epic and i would want to be able to hopefully get along with those two quality friends if they're so important to you and your life that's fair look for me personally like i don't actually care if they've got one or two good friends for me my kind of red flag in that scenario or where it becomes a non-negotiable is if this person just doesn't have any friends and that they blame everyone else but themselves mm. and that's where i find an issue because it's like you're the common denominator in all your issues mm. Um, yeah, also just one more non-negotiable. I don't know if we even spoke about it properly, but I think you and I will both agree with this. It has to come from a good family. And yeah, yeah, look, you can't pick your family and I understand that. So obviously if you've come from a very complicated situation with where you've been brought up and who, you know, your parents and everything, I think that can leave you with a lot of trauma and it can, you know, instill a lot of things in you, some good behaviors and bad behaviors. The people are at least willing to recognize kind of the negative aspects of it. That's fine. But if you've come as a non-negotiable from a really good family, you know that the person you end up marrying, you'll end up marrying their family as well. Yeah. You're going to have kids with them. So you want to know on one hand that, you know, you're going to have a child, your grandparents, you're going to, they're going to have two sets of grandparents, your parents and their parents. Mm. You don't want to mess around with who you pick with, with respect to that. Yeah. And I think in terms of, you know, you mentioned coming from a good family. For me, it's more about do they get along with their family and do I get along with their family? And that's what I think about mm. when I think of the word good, like in terms of a good family. You know, good can mean, you know, you can come from a good family that, you know, y- your parents might be divorced. It can still be a good family. It's not to say that a good family is only from a family where the parents are together. You know, they're many ways to look at good families and i think completely it's, agree yeah and i think it's how the family interacts together and how you as the person get along with your family if you get along well with your family that's good in my eyes and that is awesome for me if you don't get along well with your family that's where my eyebrows start to raise a bit in in terms of whether i would want to pursue that in 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 terms of you know taking on a relationship here because like you said you're dating you're dating the family as well as dating the partner you know this is the person that's raising your kids as much as you're raising your kids and you know family is so important to me it's so important to you and you know when I think about the time spent sitting around the table for for dinners and lunches and and seeing you know my cousins bring their girlfriends and their wives and seeing how well it all gels and how much fun we all have it's like i've i've always craved that for myself as well and i would want that so much as well in my future relationship to be able to get along with you know my future partner's family as well as you know she can get along with mine and i think that's a very fair quality a very fair non-negotiable for people to have is the importance of family and the importance of getting along with family. I love that. Nothing else from my end. That's, I think I've covered all mine. What about you? I think, uh, I think we've nailed it quite well, mate. And, um, you know, if you guys think of any further non-negotiables for you, we would love to hear them. And there's, there's plenty others. And I'm sure there's a lot more, more nuanced ones as well. So we'd be really interested to hear and maybe hear about the ones that you might disagree on that we might have mentioned. So thank you for listening. If you enjoy, please chuck us a rating, let us know and follow along for more. See ya. Bye.